Barry, thank you very much for those very kind words, and uh, thanks for having me here, ladies and gentlemen, and, um, and staying to listen to me after that rousing <laughs> talk from John Redwood, which is hard to follow, of course. Um, so, uh, my, my main point is that there are huge gains from Brexit, and unfortunately, the great British establishment have treated Brexit as something that's bound to injure us, and the government has treated Brexit like a damage limitation exercise, and that's why we have such a terrible withdrawal agreement where everything has been, uh, every thing that we want out of Brexit has kind of been downplayed in order to keep as close as possible to the European Union. And this is just the wrong way to approach Brexit. The whole point about Brexit is to leave the European Union, to leave the customs union, to leave the single market, and that's what the referendum vote was about and what people voted for. And those things are not just politically important, giving us freedom from laws that are made in other countries, which is obviously a, a central issue in the referendum. But it's also economically important because freedom is good for the economy as well as for political uh, absence of restraints from what we want to do, which, which is very important. But if the Treasury had been right in its project fear that by getting political freedom, we would wreck our economic, our economy, then it would have been right to think about that quite carefully. And they hoped that they would wipe the floor with the, the Leave campaign by arguing that it would damage the economy, but of course they got it completely the wrong way around. The whole point of political freedom is it strengthens economic freedom, and economic freedom strengthens the economy. And that Brexit was a huge bid and is a huge program for liberating the economy from very bad things. And in this I, I, I agree very much with what's been said already by my distinguished fellow speakers here. The, so I'm going to assume that we will, we will have Brexit. And I'm going to argue that the best way to get Brexit is through no deal, because through no deal we can achieve rapidly everything that Brexit set out to achieve. Whereas, of course, under Mrs. May's deal, we will get Brexit, but it will take us a very long time and an awful lot of negotiation to get back on track with what Brexit is supposed to be about. Now, I'm an optimist about these things. As long as I remain a parliament, doesn't destroy Brexit altogether, which is my biggest nightmare. Because we all worry every day about all these votes that are going on about stopping Brexit and having more referenda against the people's will. And we've already had a referendum which expressed the people's will. And anybody who argues the people didn't know what they're voting about doesn't know the British people. They did know what they were voting about and they fundamentally got it right. There hasn't been anything that we've discovered since that they didn't know at the time and that wasn't fully explained about the EU and about how it, would, how it could behave and how, how hostile it is to the sort of agenda that we, we have in, in, in Brexit. So my biggest fear, actually, is that this Remain a Parliament will stop Brexit altogether by some trick or other. And this we have, to, we have to be aware of, because the worst thing of all would be if we get no Brexit at all because of a failure of the Parliament to do what the people, the people voted for. And as long as we get Brexit, I'm an optimist. Even if the worst sort of deal is made, and I'm no advocate of Mrs. May's deal, I'm an optimist that in the long run, countries that are sovereign get what they want. They can't be trammeled 
in treaties that make no sense for them. In the long run, international treaties have to go with the grain of what each country has as its interests. Otherwise, of course, those countries are going to leave those treaties. There's no way in which you can keep a country in a treaty under an international law if it's against its interests. So I'm an optimist. Provided we leave and become sovereign, I'm optimistic that the British people will get what they want. But the best way to get what we want is through no deal, because we get there fast. We get there on March the 29th, basically. And that is a big bonus. Now, what are the bonuses from no deal and from leaving on time and going straight into uh, a world in which we are free to sign our own trade agreements and to also carry out these Article 24 discussions with the EU itself. So we will continue to have free trade with the EU under the so-called Article 24 um, discussion, which which has been highlighted in the so-called Malthouse B uh, compromise, which has been has been kind of put together by a bunch of conservative politicians to allow us to leave under no deal and form a variety of mini-agreements, including discussions about a future trade agreement with the EU, which makes, which is of course just common sense. But the EU won't, won't discuss until, until we've left. Because for the reasons that John Redwood gave, they think they've got us under their, under, under their thumb. And until we've actually left, they won't do serious negotiation about our future relationship. And that, that, that is something that we want to do. We want to have free trade with the EU, just like we want to have free trade with the rest of the world. Now, what are the gains? Well, they're huge, because free trade with the rest of the world is critical. The EU is a highly protectionist organization. The tariffs it places and the non-tariff barriers it places on food, a basic staple of, our, of, of, of all of us, and on manufacturing, is no less than 20%. This is, this is a huge number. Raises prices by that amount for these products. So we're paying for food that's 20% more expensive than it should be, and we're paying for manufacturers across the board 20% more expensive more than we should be. And a lot of this we're buying from the EU at highly inflated prices, therefore, inflated by that 20%. So this getting rid of that is a major important priority of Brexit. It is to get rid of that protection. What will it do? It will bring down prices. It will bring down the consumer price index by about 8%, we reckon. It will raise the living standards of a lot of the poorest people in our society that heavily use food. And of course, by also getting rid of the subsidization of unskilled EU immigration, it will help also to raise the living standards of those much poorer people who compete with unskilled workers from the EU at very low wages. So the living standards of our, the poorest people in our society would be boosted, we reckon, by about 15% by this fall in prices and this ending of the subsidization of unskilled immigration from the EU. So this is a big direct bonus to ordinary people. But it doesn't stop there, because when you take off protection, what you do is you increase competition in your economy. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of competition. And competition is a basic feature of our economy that boosts productivity and lowers, lowers prices. It's something we've always had at the heart of our, our policies, <laughs> because it makes industry more efficient. We shouldn't be afraid of that. And nor should we allow producers who don't want to face more competition, to argue us out of, of them having to do that. Because these spurs to competition are at the heart of how we're going to get rises in living standards for our economy and our people. So free trade, getting rid of this EU protection, is absolutely at the heart of raising our living standards. And we reckon that that extra competition, which means being facing down producer interests in this country that don't want that competition. That will raise our living standards by another 4%. That's how, that's how important 
that gain in productivity is that we can get from free trade. And then it doesn't stop there because the other major thing in our economy is regulation. Now across our economy, due to the single market regulation, the EU holds sway. It's increased bureaucracy in the City of London by all these intrusive regulative uh, interventions, MIFID 1, 2, and soon we'll have 3, all these things in the City of London that raise the price, the prices of services and impede the efficient, the efficient delivery of these services in our most vital industry, the city. That financial regulation, then the raising of energy costs by very intrusive regulation of our energy industry. Then there's the whole way in which the regulation is orientated towards the interests of big manufacturers on the continent. I mean, you, you hear Sir James Dyson talking about the way in which his own firms have been held back by the, the regulation of Hoover's in, in the interests of the big German manufacturers. This is all part of the story of regulation for the single market. So, and of course we mustn't, we mustn't forget also the way in which the regulation in the EU is orientated towards the precautionary principle to stop things happening. So our, our pharmaceutical industry is held back by the EU. Our biotechnology industry is held back by the EU. Our farmers are held back by the EU because it won't commit the latest innovations to, 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 be, to be used because they're constantly stopping things from getting into production in the interest of this so-called precautionary principle. All that is at stake in our regulation. And we reckon, again, the scope for, for, for growth in the economy through due to better regulation, at least 2% um, on our GDP. And when you add that to the amount of money we, we, we pay over to Brussels for for all sorts of things that aren't in our interests. And the, the, the way we subsidize unskilled immigration from the EU through our taxpayer benefits that we pay freely to all, to all the immigrants. When you add all these things up, we reckon that about the, the, the growth in the economy directly from leaving the EU through introducing these new policies that I've described, free trade, our own regulation, control of immigration, getting rid of all these, um, all these taxpayer subsidies to immigrants, going to be worth about 7% on GDP. A higher growth rate of about half a percent a year over the next 15 years is, is what's at stake here. So that, that's the background to a, to a Brexit budget. That's 7% in total over the next 15 years of boost to our economy which in itself brings in about 80 billion more in present value, in present uh, money terms to the Treasury. A pretty sizable sum is what will come from Brexit economically. And that is what the Treasury just have not factored in. They've refused to do it because it's like the wars of religion. It doesn't matter what you say to the Treasury in terms of models and arguments. Because they're so hostile to Brexit, because the whole British establishment is so hostile to Brexit, you cannot have a proper professional discussion with the Treasury or any other civil servants or indeed most of economists because for religious reasons, they won't listen. They just stop their ears up and say, nah, 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 you know, basically. Because we have pointed out time and again to the Treasury how all their calculations are based on rotten assumptions Originally, they were based on rotten models as well. They, they finally lessened that bit and brought in some new models which were better. I won't bore you with the details, needless to say. But they got these better models and then they plugged into them the most awful assumptions. And we've been explaining this at some length to them, including, as John Longworth said earlier, the assumption that there would be huge barriers at our borders with the EU because of primeval practices being brought out that are completely illegal today and completely against modern practice and against WTO rules. You know. The borders have to be, as, as John explained, seamless and, 
pre-notified electronically. So, so the Treasury have denied the Brexit dividend time and again because they will not engage with these, with these points. And one of the things that will, will happen after we've got Brexit is that this war of religion element will drop out and people will look scientifically at, at what's, what we should do to policy and will not think about it in this wars of religion way. So we'll actually get a dialogue that's scientifically based. And I can tell you that that dialogue will mean there are big gains. Because everybody who looks at economics knows that there are huge gains from free market policies. Uh, and it, there's no future in this sort of backward-looking regulation, in this protectionist policy. So turning now to that budget, look, this dividend is huge. If you take a dividend of 80 billion, which is 10 percent of current revenues in the UK, that is a sizable number. Now you add it to where we are in the economy today. Now the most telling statistic that's come out in the last month or two has been the statistic for the public finances. They have gone into the direction of surplus at a fantastic rate. They're now running the, the overall borrowing requirement of the, of, the, of the Treasury is now running at only 1% of GDP, way below what the Office of Budget Responsibility projected some, uh, even last year. And what's been happening is that revenue has been growing fast. That can only mean one thing. The economy is growing well. Now, revenue is an up-to-date number. It's actually accurate. If you look at the Office of National Statistics projections of GDP, they're embarrassingly inaccurate. If you go back 10 years or 20 years and look at what GDP the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, thought was happening then, you find they've revised it several percentage points. In fact, you go back to the 1980s, which which Barry mentioned, the, the, the 1980s recession under Mrs. Thatcher when she first came into office. It was at the time thought to be horrendously big, and now it's almost gone completely out of the statistics. Now, when this is because these attempts by the Office of National Statistics to add up everything we're producing rely on a huge amount of information they don't have. So they have some figures up to date, but most of them are very out of date and based on surveys which get revised later substantially. But the revenue from the, Her Majesty's Treasury gets is never revised because it goes straight into the Treasury's pocket and they know what's in there. Just like I know what's in my pocket, this three quid. <laughs> In the Treasury, they got many more quids than that. And it's been growing at a rate of more, of more than 4% a year over the last three years. Now, that's, that implies that GDP has probably been growing at about, at about 4% a year, including prices. And in real terms, probably been growing about 2%. My expectation is that in 10 years' time, by which we will unfortunately have lost interest, <laughs> the Office of National Statistics will tell us we haven't had, we haven't had growth of 1.3 or 1.4% or whatever it is they're saying at the moment. We've had 2% pretty much regularly throughout this period. And when you, when you, when you look at the labor market, that's almost common sense, isn't it? Because we have the record job creation. We have record employment in the UK. It's the highest it's ever been. 76% of, uh, of, of people of the, of the relevant age group. And unemployment that's so low, it's almost certainly lower. We didn't have the statistics in the early 70s when it was very low, but almost certainly lower than it's ever been in this country. So this all fits with the idea that the economy is actually doing rather well. Now I accept that some investment has been put off. But that investment will come back on track once we've got Brexit, because people will know what the prospects are, and they'll, they'll bring on 
the investment that they may have deferred until this government, you know, uh, and, and this parliament have finally got us Brexit. So, turning then to the budget, if you've got this money to spend, I would say this. Look at the projections for debt. Debt is coming down as a percent of GDP. It's, it's, now, it's now well below its peak of 80% of GDP. It's now down to 74% of GDP. And homing in on that magic figure of 60%, where we know that everything's kind of safe. This is the sort of recommended safe level of debt. It'll get to this level of 60% of GDP even without Brexit by 2024. You add in Brexit, it'll get there even faster. And we reckon that you can safely spend 25 billion a year extra on extra spending and tax cuts this coming year, 2020. And then another 45 billion, another 40 billion, I beg your pardon, in 2025. And still hit that 60% magic figure by, by 2025. So you can have a safe projection of debt and you can cut taxes and you can add to some vital <coughs> spending and to the tune of 65 billion pounds a year, that's about 8% of the current budget spend by 2025. So we've got several years in which, in which the budget can be liberalized substantially and what could we do? Well, various ideas have been mentioned already today, but I would say the main things we need to home in on is our competitiveness in terms of business. We need, I would say, to think about um, cutting corporation tax, cutting corporation tax, cutting income tax. Getting rid of that ridiculous top rate of tax, that, that super top rate of tax of 55 that went up to 60% is just an invitation for expropriation of our highest flying entrepreneurs. Getting rid of all that stuff. And with the numbers I've given you, we could cut corporation tax by 5% by 2025. We could cut in income tax by 2% by 2025. We can get rid of that very top rate, of the, the, above the top rate, as it were, that super, super rate, which was never should have been brought back in, because it just, it's, just a, it's just a huge penalty on entrepreneurial talent and activity, which is, which is the last thing we want in this country. And we could actually cut the top rate, you know, the, the one above the standard rate, by 2% as well. So we could have a big cut of income tax rates. More so even than Mr. Trump did in the last uh, tax cut uh, proposals in the, in, in the US. So that was important and, and very important for, for US prosperity. So we can, get, we can cut the corporation tax materially and these income tax rates. And then we can also spend money on infrastructure and vital public services. And we reckon that between all these things, using the models we've got of the economy, this would boost growth by another 3.5% in the next decade, 0.35% a year. So when you take the original Brexit dividend, that's half a percent a year, and you add on the add-on effect of actually using that dividend to cut taxes, we're talking about nearly an extra 1% a year in growth, transforming the, 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 the future of this country from being a relatively, you know, we've had a rather slow period of growth since the financial crisis. Things haven't gone too well. This would get us back into an era of growth and it would be reminiscent of the sort of growth we got after the Mrs. Thatcher's reforms in the 80s, which were crucial in getting this economy motoring and catching up with other economies and, and overtaking them in terms of living standards. So what I, what I put before you is that we need a chancellor and a government that understands all this and brings in policies that will transform the future of this country 
turning Brexit into a, from, a, from a damage limitation exercise into a, an exercise that will usher in a new dawn for growth and prosperity in this country in which living standards will massively rise among the poorest people in our community and growth will move ahead at last in a, in a, in a proper sort of way with productivity surging again in, a, in, an, in, an, in an economy that will just become open for business, will become the hottest place to be in the European continent and will turn the spotlight onto that backward museum-like area we're leaving. All, I think, to be grasped today uh, in, a, in a spirit of the, the, the great future that beckons to us from, from Brexit, provided this parliament doesn't absolutely muck it up. <laughs>